Okay, I think we're ready to get started this evening. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening, uh, our live audience and those joining us remotely uh, to, on the YouTube live stream to the Constitution Literacy Series put on by the Constant Constitution and Civility Center here at American Heritage School. Thank you for taking the time uh, out of your day uh, to come learn more about the Constitution um, and increase your understanding of this amazing document. Uh, we're confident you'll have uh, a positive experience this evening. We're going to begin this event uh, with an invocation offered by Sarah Ware, after which uh, Sherry Frankie will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Our Heavenly Father, we are um, grateful for the opportunity that we had to gather here tonight to um, learn about the Constitution. And Heavenly Father, God, please bless that we will um, be able to learn a lot tonight. And we will please bless Mr. Hancock and Mr. Hymas that they will be able to um, think clearly and say these things in thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In honor of one nation under God, please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance with me. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, before I introduce uh, the participants this evening, our debaters, uh, we'd like to share with you uh, some of the really awesome things that we have going on at the Constitution and Civility Center and uh, some of the exciting things to come. One of these things that we would like to announce uh, for tonight is the center's first ever Constitution B. Uh, students of all ages, including adults, are invited to register um, for the B at constitutionandcivility.org. Uh, once your free registration is complete, you could begin the course by watching six 20-minute videos that address five important clauses in the Constitution. Uh, these four, uh, there are four different age categories, each with its own Constitution B course. Each course is based upon the same six videos, and those video videos are embedded in each course. The only difference in the courses is the difficulty of the quizzes that accompany each video and the difficulty of the Constitution final exam at the end of the course. The older the age bracket, uh, the more challenging the questions. Um, and, the, and the fact that you know, the course uses the same six videos for all age groups, uh, it really makes it uh, something that you can do together as a family. So we encourage families to participate together. Uh, the course is designed to be completed online in the convenience of your home uh, at your own pace. Uh, but the Constitution final, uh, B final exam at the end of the course must be completed at the end of the day on Friday, April 8, 2022. Uh, the top five qualifiers in each category on the Constitution B final exam will then advance to a live, uh, in-person, uh, slash virtual age-specific event held on Friday, April 22nd at the American Heritage School, where winners will be asked similar questions to the Constitution B final exam in a live and exciting co competition with their peers as they compete for generous cash, pri cash prizes. And yes, these cash prizes are very generous. Uh, this is a wonder wonderful opportunity, and we uh, at the Constitution Disability Center would uh, like to encourage you and your family members and neighbors uh, uh, to participate uh, in our first ever Constitution Bee. So pretty exciting things. Uh, now it's my pleasure to inter uh, introduce the participants this evening. Uh, David Hancock is a member of the American Heritage High School faculty. Uh, prior to joining American Heritage School in 2010, David was a practicing attorney. He is a cum laude graduate of BYU Law School and has argued dozens of constitutional issues in court. Jeff Hymas joined the American Heritage faculty in 2016 after working for many organizations, presenting hundreds of constitution education lectures to live audiences across the, across the country. He holds an MBA from Idaho State University and is a magna cum laude graduate of BYU Marriott School of Management. Uh, also, just want to introduce myself. My name is Adam Brewer. Uh, I joined the American Heritage faculty this year. 
Uh, I hold a master's degree in public administration and a doctorate degree in political science from Idaho State University. Uh, before coming to American Heritage, I taught political science courses in higher education for eight years. Uh, I'll be serving as the moderator this evening. Uh, tonight, we are incredibly excited uh, to be discussing the war powers granted to the United States government by the Constitution. Uh, so the guns uh, will definitely be out tonight between our two debaters. I can feel it. Uh, we'll first hear from a, a brief lecture from Jeff Hymas, who will then be followed by David, who will provide his thoughts on the topic. Uh, then we will take a five-minute break. Uh, then the evening after the break will go as follows. We'll have a, about a 25-minute debate uh, between them and then a Q&A session at the end. Uh, for those of you participating remotely, uh, I will be monitoring the chat feed on our YouTube live stream, so please feel free to ask a question, and I will do my best to include those questions in our Q&A session at the end. Uh, let's begin by giving our first presenter, Jeff Hymas, a round of applause. All right, I wanted to thank uh, Adam. Adam does a great job. We have, uh, <clears throat> he does a great job with the debates and with, with organizing and, and uh, conducting this, but um, we, also, we usually have about an hour meeting beforehand where we discuss different issues, and, and he, does, he does a good job of keeping David and I off the theoretical and back into the practical. Um, and he started our last meeting by saying, just so you know, my wife said you guys kind of talked too much at the beginning. And then David said, that's what my wife said too. So I went home and asked my wife, did we talk too much at the beginning? She's like, oh yeah, you guys talk way too much at the beginning. <laughs> so we're going to make the beginning short. We're listening to you. <clears throat> so we're talking about war tonight. Um, <clears throat> and as, as I see it, there are three main questions we want to discuss. The first one is, what is the purpose of war? The second is, who makes the decision to go to war? And the third is, who is in charge of the military? Those, to me, encapsulate a lot of the constitutional questions around war and, and the, the parts that we disagree on and, and the, the areas that, uh, that we find intriguing in terms of supporting our ideas and contradicting others, et cetera. Okay. So <clears throat> the first question, what is the purpose of war? And the answer to that question is actually philosophical. It's not constitutional. There is nothing in the Constitution that says um, what war, why you should go to war, what's appropriate war, what's not appropriate war. It simply says what war is. But in terms of uh, what, you know, why should you go to war, it's simply philosophical. But in case you're wondering, I have a philosophical response for that. Here's my idea. My, it's, it's very, very simple. In my mind, philosophically, it's simply to defend our nation. And there are two major quotes um, that I think highlight this pretty well. <clears throat> the first is by James, uh, John Quincy Adams. He says this, America has abstained from interference in the concerns of others, even when the conflict has been for, the princ for principles to which she clings. She goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Okay. That, that's, that's uh, for me, one of the philosophic bases behind how, why I see the purpose of war, what the purpose of war is. And the second one's from the, um, <clears throat> from the uh, farewell speech of, of George Washington. Um, he says this, Europe has a set of primary interests which have to us none or very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics or the ordinary combinations and collusions of our friendships or entities. It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. <clears throat> so my viewpoint on that is simply, my interpretation of what they're saying, I think they're, they're sustaining the idea, is it's simply to defend our nation, not to go out in search of monsters to destroy. But since that's a philosophical question that we can debate and talk about um, all day long, all night long, um, I want to move on to more of the constitutional issues. <clears throat> and that's where we get, who makes the decision to go to war? This, for me, is very, very simple. It's very concrete. It says clearly in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, that Congress shall have the power to declare war. That's just what it says, OK? <clears throat> and so what I've done, I've kind of set the constitutional um, ex explanation or, re or words on the left-hand side and the reasoning on the right-hand side. The reason Congress should declare war is because Congress is a deliberative body, not a single person. Secondly, Congress represents the concerns of those who fight and fund the war, the people, right? They're the ones giving their blood and treasure, so Congress should be the ones making that decision because they represent us. Third, Congress is held accountable to the people for their excruciating choice, and I think it is an excruciating choice. And when you vote to send sons and daughters to war, and you know they're, they're going, some are going to die, and everybody, that's what happens in war, it's excruciating. <clears throat> I think it's designed that way because Congress is then less likely to declare unnecessary wars. They don't... Um, 
John Adams said, great is, is the uh, despair of an of a unlawful war. I right? was saying it's bad to have war. <clears throat> and lastly, I think this is a super, super important part. A declaration of war provides a clear-cut decision with a stated mission and purpose. When you declare war and Congress declares it, they've thought through it and they say, here is what we want to do and here's why we're going to war and it, it's stated. It's a clear-cut uh, uh, mission and purpose. Okay, So that's kind of the idea behind who makes the decision to go to war. To me, that's pretty straightforward, and it's written right there in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. You don't need to look anywhere else. George Washington and a couple others support this idea, I believe. And this is a quote when he was talking about, in the very beginning, when they're talking about fighting with Indians, etc. He said, the Constitution vests the power of declaring war with Congress. Therefore, no offensive expedition of importance can be undertaken until after they have deliberated upon the subject and authorized such a measure. The father of the Constitution, James Madison, says it this way. The Constitution supposes what the history of all governments demonstrates, that the executive is the branch of power most interested in war and most prone to it. It has accordingly, with studied care, vested the question of war in the legislature. Okay, of course, I'm highlighting and, and uh, emphasizing the legislature and the Congress here. His second quote says more or less the same. In no part of the Constitution is more wisdom to be found than in the clause which confines the question of war or peace to the legislature and not to the executive department. And one last quote from the Mr. Big Government of all, right? Mr. Power and the Executive himself, um, Alexander Hamilton, he was the one who argued more than anyone that we need to have a strong central government, we need to have a strong president. He said, it's the province and duty of the executive to preserve to the nation the blessings of peace. The legislature alone can inter interrupt those blessings by placing the nation in a state of war. Okay, so the second point of who gets to declare war, I think is emphatically, both in the Constitution and through Founding Fathers quotes, the Congress is, is who gets to declare war. Now, the next question, who is in charge of the military, is a lot more complex. There's a lot more depth to it. And, and there's different layers. And how we approach it will help us uh, kind of uh, unlock those, uh, those discoveries for us. <clears throat> the Constitution says, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14, it says, the Congress shall have power to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. So the question I have is, who's in charge of the land and naval forces? And I think the simple answer is Congress, because that's what it says. Um, the reasoning behind this is when the Army and Navy are not serving in a congressionally declared war, they're under the direction of Congress who calmly deliberates the following. How the Navy can remain a strong defensive unit, and secondly, if the Army should remain a strong offensive unit. So you'll notice I've distinguished between the two there. The Navy should remain a strong defensive unit, and the Army might, or may, if, okay? So we need to look a little bit more into that. The, the point being here, in the, in the regular times of peace, it should be Congress who's in charge of making the rules and regulations. Now we're going to look a little bit more in, into the Navy and, and the uh, Army, the two military branches that are actually mentioned in the Constitution. Okay, so what are the characteristics, characteristics of the Navy? Constitution, the Congress shall have power to provide and maintain a Navy, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 13. Why the emphasis on maintain? The idea that the Constitution calls for a standing Navy, a Navy that's always there, always present, always maintained. Why? The reasoning because the Navy is a defensive unit. It exists as a barrier to entry into the nation and should constantly serve as a strong force to discourage and protect against invasion. It's always there. It should always be prevalent because you don't wait until someone attacks you to say, oh, we should defend ourselves. No, you have the defense up there in the first place to discourage and to, to react immediately to any of offensive actions. Secondly, <clears throat> the Navy can't be easily turned against its own citizens. If it's primarily in the water and facing outward, to turn and tyrannize its own citizens is actually fairly hard to do. Now, let's take a look at the Army. What are the characteristics of the Army? According to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 12, it says, the Congress shall have power to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Okay, so there's a different feel on this. A Navy is, is to uh, maintain a Navy, but this says in the Army it's to raise and only for a period of two years. So let's look at the reasoning behind, oh, sorry. That's what I just said. The Constitution calls for a non-standing army, not a standing navy, but a non-standing army, to be raised and supported for a period no longer than two years. Why is that? The reasoning. <clears throat> I don't know if we're going to get some reasoning. <laughs> All right, we'll test my uh, ability to memorize my presentation. OK, um, maybe they'll be able to work it manually from there. But ooh, yes, thank you. All, when you hear the click, that means next one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because armies are primarily an offensive unit called upon to fight declared wars, okay? As opposed to navies that are defensive units that are always standing ready to defend at a moment's notice in action, right? 
armies that are raised to fight an offensive war. Oh, good, it's working. Unfortunately, armies have historically been used by military leaders to turn on their own people. Small peacetime armies guard against tyranny. I wrote that weird. Meaning, to have small peacetime armies, that, that's helpful to make sure that there isn't tyranny. Okay? If you have big peacetime armies, typically, historically, that they've turned on their own people and become very tyrannical over their own people. Uh, lastly, if the people don't like how a war is going, they can pressure Congress to defund the war, right? Because we're talking about appropriation of money. They can pressure Congress to say, defund that thing. We don't agree with it, okay? We don't want our sons and daughters to go into war. We don't want our treasure to go to that war. We don't believe it's a, a good cause. Or they can vote to replace their representatives every two years. I don't think it's coincidental that it's, it's listed for raising and supporting, funding those armies every two years because what it does, it puts the people in charge of the war through their elected representatives and people, the ones in Congress who most directly represent them are the House of Representatives and they rotate every two years. They don't like the popular war. At worst, it'll last two years because then they'll be able to flip it. They'll be able to vote for other people who don't support that war, get it defunded, um, and it won't be uh, occurring anymore. Okay, so that's the distinction between the Army and the Navy. All right? Now, the question before was who's in charge when there's not a declared war? Now we've defined what the Navy and Army are. Now the question is, well, who's in charge when we do declare war? And Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2 says, the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. Why would that be? Why do you want one person in charge? Once you declare war, why do you want one person in charge? Well, because we want efficient execution of the war's stated mission and objectives. The enemy won't wait for deliberations and speeches in Congress, right? We're going to be on the ground. We declared the war. We know what the mission and objectives are by Congress. We're going to go do it. And we don't want to go back to the 535 people and say, hey, what do you think about this? Should we do that? Like, no. Just have the Commander-in-Chief push forward, execute the war. We were told you what to do and go for it. We're not going to get in your way now, okay? <clears throat> now, it could be seen, it could be read that the president is the, is the standing commander-in-chief of a standing army and a standing navy. I feel like I've dispelled that in, in uh, Clause 12 and clause, clause 13, the difference between a standing navy and a standing army, a non-standing army. But just in case, I think it's clear in this same wording, when you look at the rest of the sentence, it says the president shall be commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the United States, and then it, it specifies it. There, there's a condition here. It says, when called into the actual service of the United States. So in other words, my view and my reading of the Constitution is the president is the commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy, but only when they're called into the service of the United States. Because otherwise, you revert back to Clause 12, or, yeah, Clause 12, where it says Congress is in charge of making all the rules and regulations for the land and naval forces. Okay? The reasoning behind this is Congress calls the Army and Navy into the actual service of the United States by Congress declaring war. Because then it puts the decision makers the legislature, the ones who make the laws, in charge of the executor. And the executor is the president who then therefore takes it and runs with it and goes and does what he wants to do. I would argue that once the war is declared, the president can do whatever he wants to do, more or less. He, has to, I, he still has to save in the mission and objectives of the war. But he's now the commander in chief of a declared war, and it's his opportunity to make the decisions on the fly, whether Congress likes it or not. But it's not his decision to declare war, and, it's, it, and he can't claim to be the commander in chief of a standing army. Um, possibly a standing Navy, and we'll see some examples as we do the debate. I'm sure about that, what's happened in the past. Okay? We're going to talk a little bit about this. I wanted to introduce some terms real quick. I'm almost done, I promise. Why the War Powers Act and authorizations for use of military force do harm. The War Power, War Power Act and authorization for use of military force are things I want to define real quick. War Powers Act was passed by Congress in 1973 to limit President Nixon from carrying out military action without congressional approval. What happened is he was um, doing a bunch of bombing over Cambodia. Congressman kind of got wind of it, like, wait, what are you doing? And he's like, look, I'm the president. I can do whatever I want to. And they said, no, you can't. And they passed a War Powers Act. In fact, it was, it was veto-proof. Um, Democrats and Republicans said, no, 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 you're not in charge. We're in charge. So <clears throat> what it said is the president can commit troops. It was kind of a, yeah, you can, you can act if you need to. But the president can commit troops to military action, but must notify Congress within 48 hours and cannot leave troops in action more than 60 days with an additional 30-day withdrawal period, without a declaration of war or an AUMF from Congress. Okay? In other words, yeah, you have a little bit of flexibility, but if you do something, you have to let us know within two days. And you can't commit us there for more than 60 days or a 30-day withdrawal period. That's what, that's what the uh, War Powers Act was. The authorization for use of military force, I'm probably blocking some of you, sorry. Um, it's not a congressional declaration of war. It allows Congress to authorize the president to take military action without declaring war. And my issue is both of these things. I don't like either one of these. <clears throat> I think the War Powers Act was going the right direction to try to restrain the, the president, but I think it didn't go far enough. Congress has the duty to declare war or not to declare war. The War Powers Act and the AUMF allow Congress to shirk the tough decisions and let military action occur without the people's voice through Congress being heard. 
That's what I don't like about those. I think it needs to go back and just stay with Congress. Okay? The War Powers Act and an AUM AUMF allow for prolonged occupations. They allow for mission creep, for UN, United Nations overreach, and for the military industrial buildup and corruption. Okay? Because there's this kind of undefined thing like, yeah, I just kind of, no. Okay? Presidents have largely ignored War Powers Act and AUMF restrictions, and Congress has not done anything about it, so the president is really declaring wars by default. And that's, that's what I argue is not what he should be doing. Lastly, if a president chooses to bomb a country, which clearly falls within the 60-day War Powers Act, right? It's within 60 days, okay? Then he could single-handedly force the U.S. into war and subvert the constitutional mandate for Congress to declare war. And next thing you know, we have a king. We have a monarch who's saying, I'm going to start this war and push the button on the bomb. And Congress is like, wait, that's our decision. Oh, because I have 60 days. I can do what I want to. Well, you're committed at this point. You can't just bomb and say, oh, never mind. That was our president. That wasn't us. Sorry. Hope it didn't hurt, right? No, you're actually in at that point. He commits us without the Congress getting to choose. Okay? Oh, there's the last one. By constitutional design, it is Congress's duty to declare war because Congress represents the people. It, it's, it's not a shared duty of the president. It simply isn't shared. It's not his job to do that, in my view. Okay? So what is the purpose of war? To defend our nation. That's a philosophical answer, not a constitutional answer. Who makes the decision to go to war? Congress. And who's in charge of the military? Congress during peacetime. And the president when the military is called into service by Congress declaring war. Did I go shorter this time? Hope so. That's me. That's all I have to say. I got to tell you, it's hard to keep up with Jeff. He, uh, he talks so fast, it's hard for me to, to even compete with him and to try to get in half the words that he does. Um, the other thing I think on this particular one is I think he's got the easier argument, the simpler argument, and mine's a little bit more complex and perhaps nuanced. So I'm going to start off with, a, with a, uh, a brief little summary of where I think the, the power is. And so I think that I'm going to approach this from three different positions, three different prongs to it. And the first one is, is that the federal war power is a shared power, not an exclusive or divided power. And that's uh, quite different from what Jeff said. The other thing that I want to point out is war is not now, nor ever has it been, a binary condition. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit more later. But I think that's an important uh, aspect to keep in mind as we're looking at what the Constitution was talking about. And then the last point that I'm going to make is a historical uh, point, and it is that historically a declaration of war rarely preceded hostilities. So by the time anybody got around to declaring war, war had been going on for a very long time. And so we're going to take a look at that and kind of see uh, where we're at. So we're going to begin here with war as a shared power. And we're going to start off here, uh, just a quick summary, I think, of what uh, Jeff was saying. Is these are these two important clauses, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, and Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1. And in one, it says Congress has the power to declare war. And in the other, it says that the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief. And what this tends to do is create this uh, idea that, that the war powers are divided that they are in two completely separate and distinct spheres and never the twain shall meet. And I think that the reality of that is really quite different. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the provisions that uh, Jeff showed you. And I've highlighted what I think are the important ones. Uh, these aren't all the provisions. That, but this is the 11th through 15th clause of Article 2, Section 8 granting to what I consider to be the war powers to Congress. And you look at these, and all of these do have a, a, a large grant of power to Congress and an ability of Congress to do many things. First one is to declare war, but they also are to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, to, prevent, to, to create rules for the military, and to provide uh, for rules for calling into federal service the state militias. And so you look at that, and that, that isn't just a single war power. That's a large collection of war powers, all of which are granted to Congress and into the discretion of Congress and to the ability of Congress. 
On the other hand, we have this, and I'm going to have the full clause here. The president shall be commander in chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. That when called into service, I don't think modifies army. I think it modifies militia. And so I think that the commander in chief of the army is always the president of the United States, regardless of whether it's wartime or peacetime. But then there's another clause in Article 4, Section 4, which basically guarantees to the states that the United States will protect them against invasion and against domestic violence. So there is a reason for an army separate and apart from merely protecting the United States against invasion. And the Constitution rec recognized this. It's difficult if a state is experiencing domestic violence or insurrection for the President of the United States to call up the militia of that state. And so I think that's a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting thing. One last clause of the Constitution that I want to point out to show that these are our shared powers is here in Article 1, Section 7, Clause 12, where it says, every order, resolution, or vote to which the concurrence of the Senate and House of Representatives may be necessary shall be presented to the President of the United States and require his signature before it shall take effect. Now, I was paraphrasing there at the end. But it is a question that has been raised by many constitutional scholars. Can a president of the United States veto a declaration of war? And I believe that he can. And that's because although Congress is given that power in Article 1, Section 8, it's no different than any of the other powers that are given in Article 1, Section 8. And the president of the United States has the ability to veto any of those. And so he very much is a participant in the legislative process, which includes the idea of declaring war. And consequently, I see the war powers more like this. You have this collection of things, and they overlap. They are shared powers, shared between the legislative branch and the executive branch. And this is also true when it comes time to resolve the war. The president or the executive branch negotiates the treaty, and the legislative branch through the Senate then ratify that treaty. So not only do hostilities begin with actions of both the legislative branch and the executive branch, but they also conclude or terminate with actions of the executive branch and the legislative branch. Okay, now, next. It's oftentimes thought that war is a binary condition. And this is kind of visually how I'm trying to represent that. On one hand, we have peace, and on the other hand, we have war. And it's almost as if we have a light switch, and we walk over there, and we flip the switch, and we go from a state of peace to a state of war. And that we then, when it's done, we go and we turn the switch off, and we go from a state of war back to a state of peace. And the reality is really quite a bit different gone backwards now. Go one slide forward. There we go. One more. The reality is quite a bit different. And instead, what we have is war and peace are just two points on a continuum. And as we move along this continuum, we move away from peace and closer towards war. And I think that, that people that have lived in our modern world, and even, frankly, all the way back to 1776, recognize that we, we don't necessarily live in a time of peace or a time of war. It is this constantly changing state where there is more tension or less tension, where there is fighting nearby or there is not fighting nearby. And, and this kind of creates or I think undercuts the kind of binary approach um, that, that Jeff is proposing. As part of this, here's Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3. Uh, this is a prohibition on the state. And I think that here what they've done is they have uh, Congress, or sorry, the, the Constitutional Convention really did a nice job in, in kind of showing that they know how to say, President, you can't declare war, or you can't go to war. And this is a prohibition on the states, and they say, no state shall keep troops or ships of war in time of peace 
or engage in war, which I love, very clear. But then it also has an exception. Unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger, not necessarily that they have been invaded, they haven't been invaded, but they're in imminent danger as will not admit of delay. And I think that this particular clause really demonstrates that there was this anticipation that states would or could need to engage in war even though a state of war had not been declared. Now, we're going to go to a little bit of history. I hope I don't bore everybody and put you all to sleep. But uh, this is not a declaration of war. And this goes to another kind of an aspect of this is since the state or the Congress has the ability to declare war, I believe that it also means they can declare everything less than war. They can declare open hostilities and everything escalating all the way up to war. This was done in 1802 by Congress um, in response to the raids of Barbary pirates on U.S. shipping in the Mediterranean. And Congress authorized the raising uh, and formation of a fleet and then gave the power to President Thomas Jefferson to go out and wage hostilities out on the state of Tripoli. Now, some of you might remember singing the Marine Corps hymn and remember that we uh, there that they talk about from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. And this is exactly what they're referring to because the Navy is on a, an offensive force. They have a naval infantry, we call them the Marines, and what happened, it wasn't the Army that went and fought this, it was the United States Marines instead who did that. Um, let's see, let's go to this last point. I really have it quite short on this, I hope. And it's just, I want to just point out that hostilities oftentimes begin before war is declared. And this is just in one example. And this is the, the things that the Founding Fathers would have been most familiar with was the Revolutionary War that they had just completed. The first conflict or the first open hostilities began in April 19th of 1775 with Lexington and Concord. Um, shortly thereafter that, there was the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17th. On that same day, George Washington was made the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. Keep in mind, at this point in time, the 13 colonies are all part of England. But they have made George Washington the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. And you go on and you see that uh, they actually, actually do an attack into, into Canada. They try to seize the city of Quebec. The Navy, the Continental Navy, goes down south and seizes an island in the Bahamas from the British. And then it's only July 4th, 1776, where we get around to declaring war, more than a year later, with the Declaration of Independence. And what I think this demonstrates, and, and when we look at, at history generally, what we can see is, is that this is something that is true in all of the conflicts that the United States has been involved in. Hostilities begin, and then war is declared. That, by the way, was also true of all of the wars that England fought in the century before 1776, with just one exception, where the King of England initiated the hostilities after declaring war himself. So uh, based on these things, I, I say that, uh, that it's, uh, it's a shared power. Anyway, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, before I dismiss you for the five minute break, uh, we just would like to uh, highlight the sponsorship of Lehigh Donuts who provided the delicious refreshments that are out in the lobby this evening and also the amazing work of Kimberly Heath uh, in setting up for the event this evening. Uh, thank you so much. We'll come back together in about five minutes. Uh, so please enjoy the refreshments and we'll see you back here soon.
Okay, we'd like to welcome everyone back uh, from our break. Uh, why don't we go ahead and just do a quick round of applause to invite those that are still out in the lobby to come back in. <laughs> Works every time. Uh, okay, well, we're gonna enter the uh, debate portion of our evening and uh, we're gonna start uh, our debate with, uh, I, have a, I have a question for Jeff, uh, just to respond some, to some of the David's points that he made. One question uh, that comes to mind is, you know, does historical precedent of hostilities before an actual de declared war, like some of the examples David uh, shared, does that justify, justify preemptive hostilities in wars conducted today by the U.S. government? Yeah, well, that's... Um <clears throat> Yeah, that's the question I would, I would ask, too, and I think the answer is, but just because something's been done doesn't make it right. It just means that it's historical. <laughs> and so the fact that, uh, that we've entered into hostilities and, you know, Britain hardly ever declared war and everyone started punching each other before they, you know, had it, that, that doesn't make it right. That just makes it historical. And so I would say, that's, that's what America did. They had a chance to start over. So we don't like it this way. We want to make sure we have this loud enough. We want to make sure we... Um, uh, have a system in which we're not just running around having perpetual wars all the time with everyone fighting and no one really knowing who's, um, who's doing what and what's being done. And it, it becomes a little bit too messy that way. I guess, can I respond to a couple of things he said in his, in his presentation? Certainly. The first thing I think it's really important um, educationally for us is to understand that both Dave and I, our presentation, I think, I think, I hope we did a good job this time of showing how different our perspectives are, even though they're both like right there in the Constitution. What we both agree on is the power of checks and balances. There has to be a power of checks and balances. But in my view, my estimation, David's is, is, is a shared tension, okay? There's, a shared, there's an overlap, there's a tension, and mine is a separation checking, right? And so when, when David referred to the president being able to do certain things and said that's a shared power, I say, no, that's, that's not a shared power, that's a checking power. They're their own individual executive unit, and they check the power of the legislative body. They don't share, they don't mingle, they, they don't um, have the same duties, and they just kind of are in tension with each other. But to be fair, that's simply a different interpretation of a true constitutional principle, a true freedom principle of checks and balances. Mine is more of a separation, a check, and his is more of a shared, a check in that tension. Um, that, that's, a, that's a difference, right, in, in terms of how you see that. Another one is with the Triple E Pirates. My view is, it's funny, Dave and I do this all the time. We're teaching our students, and <laughs> he'll pull up a screen, and he'll have a quote on They're like, that's the quote I was going to use. You can't use that, right? I said that last time. I think I said that every presentation we've done so far. When he pulled up the Triple E Pirates, I'm like, oh, man, that's the one I was going to use. Because my view is, what Congress said is, it's very clear in, the, in the, um, the quote we showed you, Congress authorized President Jefferson to use the Navy to defend us. And in David's view, he's saying that was an offensive action. It's over in the shores of Tripoli, it's over in the Mediterranean. My view is the Navy was simply defending because the, the Barbary pirates weren't on the shores of North, North Carolina where the Navy could defend themselves. They're actually attacking uh, commercial units, U.S. commercial units in the Mediterranean. And so it was still a defensive measure, even though it wasn't right, right next to our shores, it's still a defensive measure. And it was still Congress authorizing the Navy to go do that defensive thing. So that wasn't a, oh, this is, a, this is actually an exception that Thomas Jefferson and the early founders did, was they just realized we need to kind of go to war in a kind of a loose state. They're like, no, we know that it, the defensive unit is called the Navy, and we know we're in charge of them, and we're going to authorize the president to command them to do this thing. So to me, it still falls within, within that, the, the, you know, the construct that I, that I see. You know, I, I love these conversations with Jeff because they do, they help me to reconsider and think about things. But um, I think on this one, we have the clearest distinction that we've had in, in these uh, lectures as to which position we're on. Um, four of the first five presidents of the United States oversaw incursions by the military into foreign powers. Um, John Adams. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and Monroe. All four of them were undeclared wars. And uh, so to me, that's, uh, when you look at those four men, those are four of the names that are some of the most important ones when we're looking at constitutional um, interpretation. I mean, these are the founding fathers. If they understood it that way, then I think if if we're trying to understand it something differently, we have to we have to kind of go beyond what um, 
what maybe a, 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 a relatively straightforward reading of the Constitution would, would say. And that's why I think, for me, it's, it's you take the Constitution as a whole, and I'm a bit of a structuralist, and you look at the way that things work and put them together, and then that's how you help, that's how you understand it. Yeah, but, but what's interesting is, is you look at the quotes that I presented, it shows Madison and Washington and, right, saying what I believe, and then you show the historical actions, you know, uh, then you start to see that it's actually very complex, and you can have two very reasonable people draw different conclusions that have very, very important and impactful um, results. It's not just philosophical. War is very, very real. <laughs> and uh, my view and David's view lead to, to, they diverge, and they diverge quite widely. Um, but you can see how, it's just weird. It's interesting. <laughs> when you look at history, what they say, what they do, what I view happened at the Tripoli War, which is a defensive thing, the standing Navy, and David sees that as an offensive thing. It was an actual war, and we can't you know, call it not a war. It was a war. It's just, it's interesting to see that. It's just fascinating. So just to ask a clarifying question, David, um, you know, just thinking about, uh, you know, the point you made about the, the presidential actions. So, you know, taking the nuanced approach that you do uh, to the war powers of the United States government, um, you know, does, does that nuanced approach potentially lead to, you know, the notion that the, the, the power to declare war by Congress is actually meaningless, right? That, so you know, what, what meaning can we attribute to this clause when it simply hasn't been followed since the beginning of the Union? Yeah, you know, there are plenty of people that I think have said that that particular clause in the Constitution, that Congress shall have power to declare war, is somewhat meaningless, and it's been exercised so rarely. And that's why I like to, to look at all of the war powers together. And, and there is no question that Congress has significant war powers. The president cannot create a navy. The president cannot raise an army. He can't fund an army. He can't fund military forces. And, and so what I see is, is that this is truly a shared opportunity or a shared uh, power and a shared mission. Congress and the president do have to act in concert. And I think what we've seen over the last 230 some odd years is, is that Congress has created and provided to the president certain tools. And those tools include the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the Air Force, etc. And it, once they've provided those things to the president, the president then has the ability to, to use or to exercise those tools. Congress, of course, has the ability to reduce or to eliminate those tools if they feel that the president has uh, misused them. And I think that Jeff rightly pointed out the, the, um, uh, the limitation on the, the army that they can only have um, funding for two years at a time. And so I do think that shows some mistrust of standing armies. But when you go and you look back into the constitutional, uh, the debates in the Constitutional Convention, they were all over the place on who was supposed to act and who was supposed to do what. You have some members saying, no, the president should have this power just like the king of Great Britain does, where he gets to be the commander in chief and declare war. And you had others that said, no, Congress should be both the commander in chief. And then you have just about every possible combination in between. And so I, I think that, that for me, it really does come down onto this concept that this is a shared power and wise presidents consult with Congress before they use the power. Um, they don't always and they haven't always, but in most cases where the president has acted without congressional pro approval, and that's probably just what I would say is tacit approval, that um, it usually turns out badly for the president because they don't have the consent of the country behind them. Any thoughts in response to that, Jeff? Um, no, I think we, I, I think a, a question would be good. I think I might go in a circle at this point. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just thinking about, uh, this, this notion of shared powers, right? So you, you know, you talked about how, and we've talked about this in previous sessions, uh, you know, about, you know, what powers are shared and which, you know, what powers, uh, between branches. So, you know, just thinking about, you know, how do you address, and this is a question I think for both of you, how do you address this criticism, you know, that launching a sustained military action, and that decision is made by one person alone, uh, the president, or can be made by one person alone, and often has been done. How, how does, I mean, because I, I would suspect that in the audience, that, that maybe doesn't sit well with people, right? That, that sustained military action 
for 60 days, and in many cases, like with Clinton and the bombing of Kosovo and other examples in U.S. history, our troops have remained there much longer than 60 days uh, against the War Powers Act. Um, so how do you, you know, respond, both of you, to this criticism that uh, you know, one individual is essentially uh, getting the United States involved in sustained military action, uh, and that's not really a collective decision often by Congress and the President? Yeah, I would say read Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. It says Congress shall have power to declare war. That's not my response. I say that's a very good question and very astute, and you're right on. It shouldn't be just one person doing that. Abraham Lincoln made the comment. He said, "Look, when you put, when you put, um, he was responding to a guy. He said your argument puts our president where kings have stood, simply issuing or uh, uh, starting wars out of jealousy, out of uh, a desire to conquer, a desire to control, a desire to for revenge. He said your your idea puts puts uh, the president where kings have stood. I think that's a really interesting comment he made." Um, I, I just go back to the idea that if you look historically what's happened, I, that's what I love about America, is America doesn't do what's been done historically. They, they set up a constitution that's anti-historical, it's anti-tyranny, it's anti-might is right, it's anti-one person makes a decision because they're divine. They must have the divine right of kings. God told them to, you know, chose for them to be born, so they're the king, obviously. America said, no, 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 no. We're going to dispel that. The president is simply going to do what Congress tells him to do. And I would say that that's how it should be. And if that's contrary to history, I think the founders would say, hey, you, you bet it is. That's exactly what it is. Thank you for reading the Constitution how we wrote it. We wanted it to be um, from the people, organically the people making the decisions and not the president. Now, is it, should the president be extremely strong and st extremely effective once uh, war is declared? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, we're not, we're not in there to play patty cake. We're in there to win a war. You go, you go to fight a war to win it. And, and the president should execute that and just go as hard as he has to and wants to. And it's his choice. Congress has to back out at that point. But to say that the president, yeah, is, is, a, is a, a king, is a single decider, that's, that's not America. America says 535 are the deciders because they represent 360 million. They're the deciders. He's just the executor. Um, you know, your question I think is really interesting and it makes me, it, it makes me think of something I looked at recently. I was, I was watching a speech that uh, uh, John Yu, uh, he uh, was a member of the Justice Department uh, shortly after 9-11 and he, he now uh, teaches at uh, UC Berkeley. But uh, he was working for the Bush administration and right after 9-11, um, Congress called him up and said, hey, we want you to draft a resolution for us to pass in Congress. And so they basically said to the executive department, hey, give us something that you want us to pass and then we'll pass it. And, and I think that that is kind of indicative of what goes on in our, in our kind of our modern uh, system is, is that the executive and Congress do communicate with each other and they are talking about what they should should be doing. Now, there are a few situations where we have had historically where they, they didn't. So, for example, uh, the bombing in Libya uh, was one of those where there was, they, they, they didn't seek congressional approval. They only notified Congress when it was in the news. And then they didn't ask for any, any funding or, or anything else on it. In fact, uh, uh, the president at that point in time said, uh, this is not subject to the war powers resolution because our forces are not actually in harm's way. They're only acting in a support position, although they had previously been actually bombing in, in Libya. And that didn't go over so well. And, and so what I would say is, is that our country works best when the branches of government work together, when they're at odds with each other, and when they, when they treat each other as people uh, where they are battling for supremacy, that's where we have difficulty. And that's where presidents, I think, potentially can get out ahead of where the people are. And they need to make sure that they are within where the people's will would be. And, and one of the ways to do that is to consult with Congress and to really seek Congress's permission. Um, I do think, though, that the president does have the ability to utilize the tools he has. And there's a huge debate on the War Powers Resolution as to whether or not it's constitutional. And um, it's something that, that probably will never get resolved. But um, in any event, it's I think it really works best when they work together and they have that shared power and that shared ideology. See, it, can I respond real quick? One thing, I think you called him John Yu or whatever his name is, the, the professor. In my view, what, what you said is exactly what should happen. Congress asked and said, hey, we need some advice. 
And I think that's fine. Congress is the one initiating, asking for the advice. The, the one thing I talked about, and I didn't explain very well, but the military industrial complex, it's a multi-billion, if not multi-trillion dollar industry where essentially, if you have if you have the executive department, it's, it's typically, in my view, it's not really the president calling the shots when it comes to war, it's the Department of Defense. Well, the Department of Defense is very much embedded with the big, you know, the big industrial complex that's producing all these killing machines, right, and all this stuff, and they're saying, um, we do need to go to war, and the industrial complex, and that's great, and military, that's great, and that just all grows because you're starting to say, it's the executive department deciding what's most strategic. Is there an opportunity for for corruption there is an opportunity for the military industrial complex to grow out of control and to do that which is not in the best interest of the people who are fighting and dying, um, but what's in the best interest of, of the complex, right? Of, of the powers that be and the money powers. Um, I think that's a challenge. I think it's great for Congress to say, hey, what do you think Department of Defense? But I, don't, I think it's horrible for the Department of Defense to say, Congress, this is what you think you must do because we've decided it. I think that's the wrong way. If we were, if, and this is, this is a progressive era idea, right? Woodrow Wilson and such coming in and saying, what we need is professionals. We need professional people who know what they're doing. Put them in government and they'll figure it out. If they're smart enough, we can have a well-oiled machine in government. And I think the founder said, no, 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 we don't want a well-oiled mach machine with professionals. What we want is people representing people who have the core values and you can have just a common regular old um, uh, representative or senator in Congress who someone can accuse of being a country bumpkin, and they can say, yeah, I am. I just think pretty simple about this. I don't think we should go to war there, or I think we should go to war. Well, yeah, but you don't have a degree from Harvard. And they said, yeah, and that's, what my that's why my constituents sent me here. The guy I ran against had a degree from Harvard. They chose to send me because they like how I think, and they like where I'm at. They like my character, my values. And I think that's, I think that's the idea of putting it in Congress and not letting the president take it, or much worse, the Department of Defense. So just to ask a, a follow-up question there, Jeff. Um, you know, so you're clear, clearly you're against the, the idea that the Department of Defense can just, you know, go into any country uh, and take, a, uh, you know, offensive action. Um, but I guess, you know, I, I, I think about just the, the hazy line between what is defense and what, what is offense or aggression, right? Uh, because surely, I mean, in, in, in th thinking of the example uh, of Tripoli that you, you suggested of, of protecting a commercial interest, couldn't the argument be made that uh, many of the military interventions of the United States government that have been made as, or as undeclared wars have been made as de a defense of economic interests of the United States and can be justified in that way? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, for sure. So what's that line? Where, where's that line between offense and defense uh, in your mind? I, I think it's very gray. I think it's very gray. Like, you know, the Tripoli is a great example. I mean, that was commercial ships, right? So why, why does the government in D.C. think that they have to protect a private enterprise shipping stuff, right? Is it their job to go out and say, hey, you're in, ba you're in pirate waters. You shouldn't do that. Oh, you're going to? Okay, well, then we'll go ahead and use our Navy to, to clear the way so you can make money. Yeah, I, that, that sounds like military industrial complex, right? It sounds like I'm using the might and power of the government to open the pathway for me to make money. Thank you very much, Navy, and now I can make a bunch of money. I, I tend to see that as what we've done a ton, right? Smedley Butler is one of the most decorated, he was the most decorated Marine at the time of his, uh, his statement where he's saying, man, I've, when I've, been, I've been all over the world um, fighting for the Marines and I look back now and realize I've just, I've just opened up the economic interest for Dole and for um, you know, the different uh, big companies. And, and he looked back and said that was the wrong thing to do. But I think it is a gray line because you do I, I do, so I, I will say, I don't know if I have a definitive answer, but I will say it does make me uncomfortable when our military is used um, to protect what they call our, our interests or our assets. Well, what are our interests and assets? What, if, I, if I create a company and I go put it in, let's say, Korea, I, I, I know there's some, some risk there. I may lose some of my assets. But if I say, I'm, because I'm American, I'm going to put that in there, then I can kind of look at the government and say, hey, come help me here. I want to make sure that I thrive. This is a great market. I know it's kind of dangerous, but the military will, will punch these guys in the face if they do something wrong, right? Thanks, guys. I, I get uncomfortable with that because I feel like that's using government to expand and proactively expand the American enterprise instead of to defend us. And if they want to take, uh, George Washington said that in the very first, right at the beginning um, in his, uh, what did he call it? Dec uh, I can't really, some, in 1791, somewhere in there, he said, look, if you guys, in the official proclamation, neutrality proclamation, in the neutrality proclamation, he said, Guys, don't go out there. If you choose to go out there, just so you know, you're on your own. We're not going to protect you. If you want to go make money in that area where there's a fight between uh, France and Britain and there's some big time things happening there, go for it. But we're not protecting you. If you, they take you, they throw you in prison, we're not going to come help you out. And I think you have the right view because it's not our deal. We're, we're not in an economic war. 
We're here to defend ourselves. And if you take that risk, you're taking the risk. We're not going to back you up. Any thoughts, David, in response? You know, I think that, that the, one of the questions is, is what does it mean to defend the United States? And, uh, you know, John Adams felt that protecting shipping interest was defense of the United States. That was the Quasi War. Uh, there were two wars fought against the Barbary pirates. Uh, those were both involved in shipping, shipping issues. And the War of 1812 was involved over, over private shipping. That's how it got started. So, you know, you look at where we started from, and a lot of these things, they do come down to what we consider as our national interest whether that is because of commercial interest, because of strategic interest, because of other things. The United States has rarely been invaded directly. And that its, its sovereign territory has rarely been invaded. Um, uh, and instead, what it has largely been is throughout, is throughout the world, the military has protected various national interests as the United States sees them. And there are parts of it, yeah, that make me uncomfortable. I agree with Jeff on that. That, that there are, are places where that becomes, um, I think, a questionable area. But I think that that's where we, we have to rely upon our morality and our concept of what is a just war, what is a, a proper use of military force um, in order to defend U.S. interests. Um, but I think from a constitutional perspective that that doesn't come into play. It's just a question of if Congress has created the military, then the president has the ability to utilize that, that military force. So it seems like, uh, you, know, you know, at least uh, you know, post uh, President Bush, right, you had a lot of neoconservatives um, that, you know, that really believed in the idea that the, United States that the United States government had a role in protecting economic interests but also just maintaining its hegemonic status in the international system broadly overall post post Cold War, right? Um, and so, you know how and you and you both talked about um, some of the things you're uncomfortable with in terms of the you know the U.S. military interventions. But in terms of the United States protecting its world power status and using the military as a mechanism to accomplish that, um, how does that? Um, how does that fly with your constitutional viewpoint um, of, because certainly we weren't a world power at the time that these provisions were adopted by the Continental Congress. So how do, how do you uh, fit those two together? You know, I, it, it's absolutely true we weren't a world power. In fact, I think one of the reasons why George Washington signed the neutrality statement was because we didn't have a sufficient Navy. There just wasn't, there wasn't the power there uh, because the Navy hadn't been built yet. Um, and had it been built to a sufficient point, I, I don't know that he would have signed that neutrality statement. Um, you know, I don't know. I think this is really tricky. How do you justify forceful intervention? And I think that there's a number of things that can make that uh, justifiable, that can make that something that's moral. And, 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 and you know, you can use a number of hypotheticals, but if, if you have a a great big old six foot four man who, who bench presses 400 pounds on a regular basis, watching somebody, you know, beat up a child, you would be really upset that that person didn't step in and stop that. Um, and to some degree, I think that the United States does have a moral obligation in the world stage, that we are a force uh, for good. Um, and so to some degree, I think that the philosophy has changed different from what Jeff mentioned when he said that the United States doesn't go out looking for monsters to slay. And I think that in the 20th century and into the 21st century that we have. And um, I think that sometimes that's okay. In fact, I wish that the United States had gotten involved in World War II earlier. I think there would have been less death. Um, I think that there are other uh, engagements where we should have been more committed um, than what we were and that that would have had a, a more full resolution to what the conflicts are. But, you know, it's the will of the people that governs and that's expressed through the Congress and through the President of the United States. And so that's, I think, where it gets hard. From a constitutional perspective, I don't think that there's that that there's any problem with it, it becomes a, a, a procedural or an operational problem. 
Yeah, I would say in critique of my own position, um, when um, when you look at reality, there is going to be, a, there, there will be in more or less, I think, a world power, a dominant world power in, in the system. Right now, that's America. And people say, are, are, then are you arguing that America not be that dominant power, let maybe Iran be the dominant power, or may, let Russia be the dominant power? At some point, you say, as much as you don't like or don't want America to be the one out, and we have, we have 750 military bases in over 80 countries. That's, that's a lot of military power, right? That's, that's Uncle Sam in everyone's backyard. <clears throat> and my argument is that that's we tick a lot of people off because we're in their backyard. Like, get out of my backyard. But um, at the same time, like I was presenting this to a friend, and he said, yeah, we have to, because he lived in Dubai or wherever he lived, and he said, we have to understand, though, but if, if, if America isn't that presence, well, then who's going to step forward? And a lot of times, it's, it's these bad players. And do you really want the bad players to be calling the shots? Do you really, is that what you really want? Um, and so this idea of having the strong player being the moral American player, that's a good idea. Except for me, I get a little bit nervous that we're not quite as moral as we think we are, and we're not quite as helpful as we think we're, we're not as helpful as we think we're being. And, and certainly that, that doesn't fit with your notion or the importance that you place on a temporary standing army, because correct. clearly all those military bases are not temporary. Correct. And, you know, and I, think, I think you could check the box and say Congress continues to authorize them every two years, so they're good to go. And I would say, I would say constitutionally, yeah, they're fine, they're checking that box. But I think it goes against the spirit of the law. I think the spirit of the law is to keep it, keep it small, keep it checked, keep us defensive, keep us strong, um, export ideas and values and republicanism um, to, to the world so they see how freedom works instead of export our gun to your head, we'll do it, but you, you, know, you do what we tell you to do. And it may just benefit us quite a bit economically, and it may just benefit our power structure. But then, but then you argue. I mean, what do you what do you do in you know, the Rwandan genocide? What do you do um, with with situations where you have a really bad uh, leader who's who's killing women and children? What do you do there? Do you just say, as a matter of principle, I think you probably ought not to do that, and hope that works out for you? There, there are things. There's an argument, and I'm like, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I, yeah, do, does America shouldn't they step in and save those innocent women and children? But on the other hand, Dave and I were talking about this the other day, when you go into Palestine and you see, clearly see an Arab punch a Jew in the face, is it not now America's job to tell that, that Arab, don't do that? Well, yeah, except that that's been happening. They've been punching each other in the face for the last 3,000 years, and all we did is happen to see the last punch. And who makes us the great moral judge of what happened? Because we're not them. They're them, and they should figure it out, not us. And when we do step in, we step in inevitably on one side or the other with our arrogance to say, I saw that Arab punch that Jew, so therefore Arabs are wrong, we will wait. And, they're, and, you know, and the Arabs are saying, that's, that's, you're not seeing the whole picture, and then, then we have a beef with them, and next thing we're shooting at each other or whatever. It's, there, there's a little, I, I get nervous about arrogance of stepping in and saying, we actually know what's right, and you'll listen to us because we're America, because we're the big dog. But I also think America's moralism, I hope, is better than maybe other big players, and so I guess I'd rather have America than Russia running the world. How's that for not answering the question? I'll, I'll agree with the last <laughs> statement. Live on YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, uh, David, uh, you, you mentioned that the War Powers Act, uh, you know, has, in, in your view, it could certainly be deemed unconstitutional, but it hasn't yet. So, you know, just as, as kind of a, you know, in, in the interest of time, uh, just as one other question that I perceive maybe you'll, you both will see differently. Uh, you know, why hasn't Congress... I, I think, you know, we, we, we talk about the intent of the founders, and I know it's difficult to highlight that, but certainly, you know, the founding fathers uh, couldn't have imagined a system of government where the branches of government weren't jealously guarding their power, right? But it seems like uh, just, you know, it, since World War II, the executive branch has been able to run roughshod in terms of military, you know, military um, uh, you know, endeavors, uh, without the uh, a, a official declaration of war from Congress. Um, and so why hasn't Congress jealously guarded that power? Or why hasn't, uh, you know, why hasn't there, um, you know, been any, any sort of legal action against the president uh, challenging that and taking it to the Supreme Court? You know, I, what I would say is I think there has, and, and that is things like the War Powers Resolution or the War Powers Act, where they, they tried to do that. They tried to rein the president back in. And, and President Nixon vetoed that, and then Congress overrode that veto. And I think that's probably the clearest time where they did. But they have done other things. They've tried to, 
to tie strings to the presidency on, on other things. And the presidency has tried to push back. Now, I, I think with the War Powers Resolution, neither side wants it to go to court because both sides are afraid that the other side might win. And if they do, then both sides lose in that significant, in that significant battle. And so I think that that's, I think that this is the tension that is healthy in a republic. Um, I do think that since World War II, Congress has abrogated its responsibility. And I think that Congress could be much, much more active and much, much more present in doing things. And so, for example, uh, when I was listening to the speech by, by John Yoo, he was talking about how, how odd it seemed that a United States senator would call him up and say, draft this for me. They have their own lawyers. Um, instead, of, instead of calling the executive, they should have done it in Congress. Um, and I think what this has shown is, is that over the last 60 years is that Congress has really just acquiesced to the president and, and created more power in the presidency by Congress failing to assert their authority. And, and if we really wanted to pull con uh, the president back into where we think he should be, then what Congress needs to do is Congress needs to assort, assert its authority. Congress needs to do the things that it can do. And to say, no, you, you want to do those things? We're not going to fund those things. You want to do that stuff? We're going to call you in here and have you testify before us and the American people and explain these things. Uh, we're going to pass a law over your veto in order to limit uh, actions that you can take or, or where bases can be built or what soldiers can do. And, and I think that's where Congress's power is, but Congress has failed to exercise its power. And by failing to exercise the power, then the president occupies that, that vacuum and, and has uh, increased the size and power of the executive. I think I'd, I'd be in danger of, uh, first of all, I agree with almost everything you just said right there. And I think I'd be in danger of just repeating the statements I've said before, so I wouldn't necessarily have a response to that. Okay, very good. Uh, well, this has been a really interesting debate, and I think uh, I agree that you you definitely see a distinction, um, you know, between both of your points of view in terms of how to apply war powers. And um, before we move into our Q and A, is there anything else that either would you like to add? You know, it's it's kind of funny, Jeff and I. When we talk about this, it 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 almost seems like the two of us flip our position. Jeff is more of the pacifist, and I'm more of the hawk. And it almost seems like he's become the liberal, and he should. You're the he conservative. Should, he should come and sit on my in my chair, and I should go sit on his chair on the on uh, for this debate. Yeah, we we've laughed about that. We've we've told our students that. Like, wait, what? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, there's. Uh, the Constitution is great. Like, I, I really appreciate Adam's questions. I think he asks awesome questions that help you realize, oh, yeah, that's a good point. And I like listening to David's responses. I mean, that I had never considered, but he said, why, why, doesn't, why doesn't Congress try to push the war back with the War Powers Act and really hold the, the president accountable? Because they're afraid they'll lose, and then all of a sudden the president is in control, right? And the president, why don't they just push and say, we can do this. You can't tell us if we can't go into battle, because we can, because they might lose, and then Congress is in charge. And so there, there's acquiescence on both sides, right? I think both sides are trying to play the political game instead of say, I'm going to man up here, and I'm going to own what I have to do, and I'm going to make hard decisions, and I'm going to get be accountable if they're bad decisions, and they're going to be accountable if they're good decisions. But that's, that's what I have to do. And, and just what to point out on that or to follow up on that, and uh, I've heard a number of people talk about why doesn't Congress want to do it? And it's because they don't want to be held accountable. Uh, the President of the United States is willing to be held accountable for that. And that's what has happened in the last 60 years, is the President has said, look, I'll make this decision. I'll be the one that's accountable to the people for it. And Congress has just said, ooh, go ahead. If you want to go there, that's okay with us. Um, and they've just kind of been hands off. And if it turns out bad, I can criticize. This is perfect. Exactly. And it's, if it turns it, out good, like I, I was in favor. It's of a win-win for Congress. They get to go, oh, yeah, look at what he did. Or, ooh, that was really bad. Look at what he did. And, yeah. you know, it's, they don't, it's almost that Congress doesn't lose. Uh, but I think what they underestimate is that they really do lose. And what they've lost is power. And really the ability to represent the American people in an effective way by just acquiescing to the executive. Very good. Thank you both. Uh, let's give our debaters a round of applause.
So we're going to uh, open up our session this evening with a question and answer session. We have a, a live mic over here on the side. Uh, and so you're welcome to ask a question. Uh, while people move over to this live mic, um, I just want to uh, give our live audience a chance. We have a couple of questions in the, uh, or excuse me, the remote audience. Um, so we do have a question from Kylie. Uh, what are your feelings on the United States' possible involvement in the dispute between Russia and Ukraine? Yeah. Should we be involved? Or like you said earlier, should the people put pressure uh, on Congress to defund any activity in Ukraine? Wow. Well, I think the clear answer to that question is, is, it is, it's philosophical. The answer is philosophical. What is my philosophy? What's David's philosophy? What's your philosophy? Not, ne none of us have a, 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 a trump card to pull on that. My philosophy is different than probably a lot of your philosophies. I think it's probably different than David's, or maybe it's the same. I don't know. Constitutionally, though, if you look just constitutionally, not philosophically, it has to be Congress's decision. It's got to be Congress. It can't be President Biden. It can't be the Department of Defense saying, hey, this is what we need to do. I'm just going to advise Congress just so you know here's what we're doing. No, 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 no. Congress says, advise us, tell us about what's going on, and we'll make the decision. That is constitutionally what has to happen, in my view. So regardless of my philosophy, even, even if Congress makes the decision to go 100% against my philosophy and, and go in and try to be the great... Um, regulator and re resolver of this concern in, in Russia, Ukraine, even if they go against me, as long as Congress is the one making the decision, then I fully support that because I understand I live in a republic and republics operate by law and laws are passed by majorities and that's how it works. I'm, I, I don't like the philosophy of that, but I like that Congress is making the decision. What I'd be absolutely against is the president making a decision, even if the president was actually on my side of, hey, let's just let this thing play out a little bit. I'd say I'm glad that happened, but it's not the president's call. It's Congress's call. I do think it's a tough decision because of, of who Russia is. I mean, they are, a, they are still a, a very significant player. Um, but at the other hand, you know, the United States already is involved. Um, we have more than 300 military observers uh, in Ukraine right now. Uh, we've sent some 10,000 troops to NATO countries uh, around Ukraine. And the... There are Americans in Ukraine, um, and there are also Americans in Russia. And in the event of a shooting war, it could get really difficult and, and really fast. Um, and under those circumstances, that's where I think that the presidency is the best one to act. And where the advantages of Congress having created this mechanism, created this military, which then can be used in order to protect American interests. And so what, what I would argue is that is exactly what they're for, is to, is to protect those interests. Now, how you go about protecting them is, is difficult. And it may not be through troops on the ground with guns in their hands. There, I think there are other ways to do that. Sanctions, um, other kinds of warfare that have been invented in the last 50 years or so that uh, I think are in many ways um, perhaps more effective for us. But... Um, when it comes time to act, I don't think we want to wait two, three months while Congress holds hearings and, and debates things. We want, we want to have action when it's, when it's in the United States' best interest to act. And I think that's what the purpose of the president is and why he does have that power. Very good. Thank you both. Uh, we have a question over here. Well, I don't know if it's a real question, but back to the Barbary Pirates, and you can uh, help me understand that. Because it seems like that... Uh, the Barbary pirates have been attacking for quite some time, and the only way that they would stop attacking is if we as a government would pay them money. And if we paid them money, then they wouldn't attack. So it wasn't just us that they were attacking. They were attacking all ships that were coming through the, into the Mediterranean and in, into their area completely. And then they would take our men and sell them as slavery, or they would uh, ask, you know, if you, have a, if you were the captain of the ship, you had to pay X amount of dollars to get him back, or they would just kill him, you know. Uh, so I think they had, they were trying to uh, protect American lives, for one thing, but they were also blackmailing America for a number of years, so many, I don't know how much money each year. So I just was curious about that. Yeah, you're exactly right, and that's what, exactly what they were doing. They were attacking all of the naval forces or all the naval ships, merchant ships that were in the Mediterranean, or at least in the southern Mediterranean, um, that they could reach. They tended to avoid the British, and there's a reason why they avoided the British, because uh, the British had the strongest navy in the world at the time. They were the superpower when it comes to the, to the oceans of the sea. 
Um, and the United States did also pay tribute to them. Uh, and so it's another thing that is a little bit odd and a little bit um, upside down. But it kind of demonstrates, I think, the, the difficulty. What does the United States do? Our, our ships are out there. They weren't owned by the United States, as Jeff has pointed out. They were private merchant vessels with private seamen on them out doing what they do, and the pirates were coming and taking them. And it is pretty horrific, but that is, I think, something that has always demonstrated that the interests of the United States are wherever the interests of the United States decides they're going to be. And in most cases, they have always said that the citizens of the United States are our number one interest. And if citizens of the United States are being mistreated, being sold into slavery, killed, held for ransom, then we need to do something about it. And so that, I think that is exactly what happened. Yeah, it is, it is interesting. Washington and Adams both gave them, I think, $60,000, like the equivalent of $3.1 million today. They both paid them off. When you say pay tribute, they paid them off. They, it was the mafia. It was, it was, it was the, the Barbary mafia. And they said, look, if you don't pay us, we're going to keep killing and taking. And, and, and they both said, it's actually the best option. It's the best of the worst, right, um, that we can do. And so it's the least offensive. Yeah, we're going to give them $60,000. And then Thomas Jefferson got into office. And Thomas Jefferson said, no more. But I would, I would agree with, uh, with David. It's a little, it's, I think it's a little too simplistic to say he had the morals and the values that, Jefferson, uh, that Adams and Washington didn't have. I think what he had was now a Navy that was actually legitimate and could fight back. And that's the practicality of it. Is that now we can actually fight back against the Bar Barbary pair of pirates, and now we're going to do it. Yeah, he sent some, some 26 ships, I think, uh, including uh, the Constitution and... Uh, ships that Adams and Washington didn't have. Yeah. Right? So it's like, well, you can't... Ships that we would call ships of the line that were, were such that they could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Barbary pirates and knock them down. Great question. Thank you. Uh, while we wait for uh, others in our live audience to... Uh, Come, uh, come here to the microphone. We have another online question. Uh, what are your opinions or thoughts on the U.S. pullout from Afghanistan? You want me to start? Go ahead. <clears throat> well, I, I think it demonstrates the challenges. Um, I'm not a military strategist. I don't know well enough. It's easy to be armchair quarterback and say, yeah, see, I told you so, et cetera. But to me, it is, it is a simple and stepping back. When you go in and try to solve a nation's problems militarily, um, and they themselves don't pay the price to solve that themselves, then when you pull out 20 years later, you get what you got when we did that. And I think it, it, it falls upon America to say, okay, now, what happened in Afghanistan, uh, hmm, I, don't know, I don't want to say this without being offensive. I'm not trying to be offensive because I don't know enough, and there's very many people who know a lot more about military than I do, but just in a general look at things, what did we do in Vietnam? What did we do in Korea? What did we do in Iraq? What did, we, what did we do in Afghanistan? It shouldn't surprise us that what we're doing isn't working because it doesn't, it isn't working. We go in and say, we're going to be the strong man. We're going to do this, this, and this, and we're going to walk away and, and it, you know, Vietnam becomes communist and Korea becomes communist and, uh, you know, things fall apart in Afghanistan and Iraq becomes kind of a, for a while at least, a, 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 nanny, a nanny state, right, of us, et cetera. I think we need to stop and look at that a little bit better, be a little more wise, and learn a little bit more from our past and say, what, you know, where are we going to go in the future? When the next opportunity to save Afghanistan, whoever that Afghanistan is, comes along, if it's the Ukraine or not, I think we need to stop and say, what's happened over and over in the past? And let's think through that. And that's all the more reason, in my opinion, why you should have 535 men and women who represent the people putting their heads together and saying, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, instead of the president saying, let's go for it. Right? I want to show it's election year. I need this. Or... Or I never liked that guy in the first place. This, you know, or Department of Defense saying, yeah, we gave that guy $2 trillion last year, and he just wasted it, so we need to teach him a lesson, right? Uh, that's, that's all the more reason why I think Congress should, should, um, should take the deliberate, as long as they need to, to decide and make the right choice. And, uh, and I do agree with David. In the, first in the part of this presentation, he said the, the president can override. I agree. The president can veto. I think it's just like any congressional decision. It has to be checked by the president through his... Um, through his um, ascension by, by, by uh, signing it, right? By signing the bill and not vetoing it. But um, that would be my overly simplistic, dogmatic answer. <laughs> uh, you know, I, Afghanistan, I think, is, um, is a really hard thing without going into the policy reasons or whatever. 
clearly the president, in my opinion, had the right and the ability to do what he did. Um, I think that Congress could have pushed back on him and that Congress should have pushed back on him. And uh, they didn't. And, and again, I think what it is is Congress acquiescing to the executive. Uh, plenty of members of Congress on both sides of the aisle said this was not the right thing to do. But they didn't, they didn't take any real action. They didn't try to pass a resolution. They didn't do anything to try to, to, to slow, stop, or otherwise fund it. It would have been interesting if they would had passed a bill specifically funding for a certain number of troops to stay in Afghanistan until the situation could be safely extricated. But it, it's, a, it's a situation. But I do think it, it shows the potential moral aspect of it as well. Is there's a group of people that for 20 years have relied upon us and relied upon the United States promises. And then the United States abruptly withdraws and you look at what's happening in Afghanistan right now, and it's, it's not a happy situation. And it's one of those places where I think that, to some degree, the United States has abrogated their moral responsibility. Uh, right. So you, you would suggest that there, you know, perhaps there is some justification for at least leaving a small residual force in Afghanistan to yeah. protect that interest of the United States uh, in, at least in that context. Yes, and, and, you know, and, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why I think they should have stayed in, the, in Afghanistan. Strategic reasons, I think that there were moral reasons, I think that, that um, for uh, our national interests and national stability, international stability, I think that there were lots of reasons to stay. And I think that it was a mistake from the Biden administration to decide to pull out, and especially to pull out the way that they did. Very good, thank you both. Uh, we have another question here in our live audience. I wish it was a clear question. Um, so first of all, let me just say thank you to you both for, um, well, for all of you, for, for putting this on. Uh, my wife and I were, have been listening mostly online and decided to come up today. And, and this has been, they've all been wonderful and great. And I love the civil discourse and debate around the Constitution, which, you know, when you study it on your own, you think, well, this is really clear to me. And it's interesting to see that the nuance that is a little bit the unclarity, the, the lack of clarity that might be there to provide for different perspectives. And, and also in a world that is politically dysfunctional, um, this is wonderful to see a great debate in a very civil format, very constructive. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I found tonight's debate really interesting. In fact, um, as I heard both of your arguments, um, I thought, wow, there's there's really good difference here, and there and there almost has been every every single time that you've you've had these uh, Friday events. Uh, what I found really surprising is as we've come to the debate portion of this, um, <laughs> where I thought there was going to be, wow, this is going to be really great debates here. I can't wait for this. And what I found is is obviously you guys have kind of really come when we're talking about situations, the nuance of what happens in the world. Um, then you know you're not as strong on your positions as you were in the initial argument section. So they're too uh, nice. <laughs> I I thought that might be true. I don't think so. After several weeks of doing this, I think they got pretty strong opinions. Um, but I think the when you when you inject different situations, especially where morality is involved, um, you tend to maybe think a little differently um, than what your normal argument would be. So I'd love to hear your comments on on that. I love that question. I think it's a great question. I think it's a very astute observation. Jeff and I have talked about this on a number of occasions with our students. We oftentimes disagree greatly on the way the Constitution should, read, should be read, but we frequently come to the same ultimate decision, but from different locations and from different justifications and uh, looking at the Constitution. You know, I think the president is 50-50 with Congress on this. And Jeff thinks that it's more like an 80-20 split. But the, the, the point is, is that in, under both cases, we think that they should pay attention to one another and should, should only act when the people want them to. I think it's, it's, it's a really great observation. And, um, so anyway, I just, it's one of the things I, I love talking with Jeff about, because we, we, we use some of the same information in completely opposite ways, like we were talking about this, the quote from, from Tripoli. 
Um, and, and this, I think, is another example. Once we get down to the brass tacks, once we get down to the actual situations, even though we seem to be quite different, I, I think we're, we're more alike than, than, than maybe either of us would like to, to, to admit. I just remember um, Grant Beckwith is our head of schools. At one time, we, I, we were on a committee, and I, and I, I worked really hard, because I, I was a lobby, like kind of a lobbyist, more or less, for four years before I started here. And I learned how to work the committees, right? You find the key players, you find who's on the edge, you get them on your side. And we won, a, we won an important vote within this committee. It was a committee to decide something at the school. And we won it. And I was like, great, we won it. And, and Grant said, well, actually, this is an advisory committee. It's not a, it's not a um, you know, deciding committee. And I was like, oh, <laughs> all right. Um, I said, how do you just, and I'm obnoxious enough to say, hey, Grant, the person who controls my destiny, I want to challenge you in front of all your people. And, Grant, what, but what, that doesn't make any sense. We have, we have an eight to four vote here. We worked hard, we've, we've battled through this. We are the committee who's thought about this and kind of holds the strings on how this works. And he says something that's stuck with me for a long time. He's like, Jeff, it's not life, real life, when you get really mature, real life is not a choice between principles and not principles. Real life is a choice between many good principles and which one to elevate in that circumstance. And so in response to your question, Scott, I think for me, when I start to hear the actual real-world examples, then, although I still hold very strongly to some pretty, pretty staunchly to some conservative, what I consider, cons well, maybe liberal in this case, um, <laughs> values and ideas and principles that are rock solid and correct, in my mind, I'm not walking away from those. I'm just saying those actually aren't the most important in this situation. I'm choosing a, a, a different principle. It's not a higher principle. It's, it's, they're the same level. It just it applies in this situation better than the one that I, so that's it. It's been a huge life lesson for me. It's been a huge life lesson as I've gone through COVID and tried to understand how to respond in my freedom orientation to it, as I've uh, worked through uh, different political viewpoints, as I've worked through what you know, Dave shares with me, and I'm like, oh man, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, you know, Adam shares with me. It's, it's, it's been a really good guiding principle for me. So I would say that's what may be an explanation of why. When we, get, when we really get down to it, it seems like we're like, oh, I don't know, because I think it's because we're saying, well, there's, there's another principle I, I want to elevate at this point. I'm going to go with that one. Well, I think that's cool. When, as we were meeting uh, and talking about our, what, what we're going to do for this evening, uh, I, I was teasing them and calling them John Kerry, the, you know, the flip-flopper. That was, that was a, you know, if you remember the election of 2004, uh, that was a term that was floating around. Um, but I think you make an interesting point that you don't, uh, Jeff, that you don't necessarily lose inconsistency in your argument when you uh, make room for viewpoints of others, right? Even when they, they, at least at the beginning, seem to totally contrast with the principles that you hold closely, uh, but you can kind of make, tr make room for that and, uh, you know, give some value or credence to those without being inconsistent. You know, and I think that that's one of the things that, you know, personally, I really love about the Constitution is because what it's trying to do is balance competing rights, competing interests. And a lot of times, the best we can do is try to balance them. And, and it's hard to say that one always wins out over the others. And I think that's what Jeff and I have realized as we've talked is, is that, you know, that there are good points. And sometimes it pains me to admit that Jeff makes good points, but he does make some good points. And it's... It's, uh, it's something that, you know, I've learned a lot from listening to the way that he talks and, and the way that he thinks about things. And I'll be honest, there are times I think, oh, wow, that's just a really simplistic way. But, you know, sometimes the simplistic way is the best way. And it makes it, 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 makes it kind of difficult for me to think, oh, yeah, but see, I've got this really complex, nuanced explanation. If you just sit down for four hours and let me explain it to you, I'm sure you'll understand. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I've said this before, but it's... Every time I talk to Dave, I learn new things like, oh, man. And I think the coolest thing, we both said this openly to our students who say it to each other, um, Adam isn't involved in you know, these same conversations. Like, it's, it's really great when you respect and learn from someone and you don't just see them as dumb or, immor or, dumb or evil, right? Um, you actually see them as very reasonable, very moral, very good. I don't agree or actually... I kind of agree. I'm going to move a little bit over in that area, right? Those, those are healthy things. That's what, that's what progress is. So which areas did you do that? <laughs> yeah, itemize uh, them right now. <laughs> there, there are many areas. The, the proper role of government, is, it used to be just, boom, it, it's just really clear in my mind. And I'm like, 
that there's there's some shady stuff. I don't know. There's some great stuff. I'm not t- totally sure about that. I'm still trying to figure it out. And that's fun. I love that. I think it's exciting. That's that's lifestyle. That was learning new things. So we have time for one more brief question. Could you talk about those military bases? You mentioned 170 military bases in 80 countries. Of course, I thought it's we 750. know 750. That's oh, 750. Okay, the number um, of military bases is very impressive, right? And they're not on U.S. soil unless you call the base U.S. soil that's now sprinkled across the globe. Talk to us in re- about that in relation to war, um, in relation to peace, and, uh, and also the constitutionality of that. This is one of those really hard areas. This is something that uh, what we would call falls within what I think they call the law, the international law of countries. And when you have a military base, even if it's in another country or a, or a disputed territory, that, that land is oftentimes considered to be sovereign soil. And so the, the idea has the been... The United States, right? Yeah, the United States. And the idea has been for centuries that if somebody does an incursion on that land, that it is the same as attacking the borders of the United States or the borders of England or whichever country you're talking about. And, and that gets to be, you know kind of difficult. So, you know, you have the embassy in Benghazi being overrun, and you have uh, other embassies, like the embassy in, in Afghanistan where we withdrew and has been overrun. And it it is a difficult thing. Um, most of those bases are in countries where the, the, the countries want us to be there. And so I think that that's an important thing, is they like us being there. Um, some of them, there's still a little bit of friction. I know that there was a time, I think it was 10 years ago, I can't remember, when Japan asked the United States to withdraw most of its forces. Um, and I think we've drawn them all out of, out of uh, mainland Japan, but we still have some in Okinawa, if I recall correctly. I could be wrong on that. But for the most part, we, they want us to be there because of the security that they provide to us. But I think that's one of those really difficult kind of questions where you look at an island like Guam or Midway that why do we have them? We have them because first off we won them in war which Jeff and I have talked about this before there's a questionable morality there and then secondly because there is they are strategic pieces of land where we want them because it allows us to forward deploy forces to connect our forces using our Air Force or our Navy or our military or whatever so that we can have a stronger strategic position. And, and I think that's just where the United States is saying, look, in our national interest, we're doing this. And sometimes we leave a country and sometimes we don't, even if they want us to. And I, I, I think it's just, it's, it's kind of a tough issue. I think that's one of those gray areas where you have to just rely upon uh, the executive and Congress to have made the appropriate decisions. Tough situation. We need to rely on Congress to make the appropriate decision, not President and Congress. Congress. Um, but yeah, I think simplistically, I've I've thought for a long time before I talked to people like David and I talked to others. That, look, in, you said you know what do those military bases do in terms of war and peace? Well, the military bases cause a lot of war and reduce a lot of peace. Right. That's my simplistic view of it. Um, one, one counter to that is if we don't take over and create a military base in Guam or w- name the place, well, then Russia will, or then Korea will, right? And so there's not just this, well, everyone's going to play nice. If we play nice, everyone else will. There, there is the issue of, guess what? That's <laughs> actually not the world we live in. So I think that's, that's a fair um, counter uh, claim to my uh, simplistic viewpoint. But I do feel like um, Ron Paul... Um, I've liked a lot of things he said in the past, probably eight or nine years ago, just this idea of blowback. Um, if, you, if you were continually getting in other people's um, affairs and continuing to be the moral superpower and we'll tell you how to do this and you must or else we're going to retract this or we're going to do this, or then, then it shouldn't surprise anyone that those countries are like, don't tell me what to do, don't control me, don't manipulate my economics, don't overthrow my dictators. Don't, um, don't bring the CIA to, to uh, choose the next president. Get out of our land. <laughs> and if you don't, we might start shooting. And, and then I think it just it escalates more and more and more. 
I, I, but I like that's super simplistic again because there's there, the reality is there's bad guys out there and shouldn't the U.S. knock out bad guys? I think maybe, <laughs> but that had to be tough. <laughs> yeah. So I I, um, I think the military bases are interesting. I think when, when countries want us there, I think that's at least that makes kind of some sense. But also, uh, maybe I, we still have to go back to, this is a philosophical question, and I think Congress needs to be the ones making that decision, not the Department of Defense, not the military-industrial complex, and all their trillion-dollar incentives. It needs to be Congress. And I think a Congress is partly apathetic and partly resistant to everything because we're partly apathetic, and we're like, I don't know. If we care enough and we get involved enough and say, no, don't do that, I won't reelect you unless you... Let's get more reason. Let's get like 20 military bases instead of 750. If we put that pressure in, and that makes sense, and we, we show to the world we're the most powerful and we're very meek about it too. We're not in your face. We're, we're there and you know we're there, and we can punch hard when it's time to punch when our Congress says. But otherwise, we're not going to try to meddle in your affairs. I think that would, that would go a long ways in my you know, perfect world. Do you have something to add to that, Dave? No, I think I'm going to just let that one lie. Okay. <laughs> That's already simplistic. I know. <laughs> I know. Stop it. Well, thank you, uh, audience members, uh, both remote and live, for the great questions this evening. Uh, you know, I was thinking uh, just in, in just this uh, conversation that we've had up here on stage uh, that for, uh, you know, an event about war, it ironically came to a relatively peaceful ending, I would say. Uh, so let's give these two uh, debaters a round of applause. Um, we'd like to thank uh, the administrators of American Heritage School uh, for supporting us at the Constitution and Civility Center in this endeavor. Uh, we'd like to also thank Jay Clark and his team on the technology um, and others who assisted in making tonight possible. Uh, we uh, remind you to please mark your calendars uh, for the next session of the Constitution Literacy Series on March 11th, next month at 7 p.m. Uh, we encourage you to invite friends and neighbors um, to watch previous sessions um, or to re-watch this session um, if you want, want more. Uh, and for other resources, uh, make sure to visit constitutionandcivility.org. Um, we hope to see you next time. Thank you again, and good night. <laughs>